What a release week. It is so rare when you happen to get this much incredible music all in one day. And while I don't have time to go into detail for all of it, I will highlight the best and the most prominent. Also because they're probably the ones you came here for. So let's get started with the one everyone's losing their minds over. The brand new 4th studio album by Tyler Childers, Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven. Tyler Childers is another artist I haven't really gotten the luxury of talking about up to this moment of time, but yeah, I love this guy's stuff. It's some of the richest and most unique Appalachian music out there, and a lot of his music has a very rustic outlaw sound mixed in with a few psychedelic tendencies. Most often in the philosophies and tales on his music, but it can sometimes interject itself into the sound of it. I practically share the same opinion as most people when it comes to discussing him. Bottles and Bibles is great, Purgatory is a masterpiece, and Country Squire is a worthy follow-up. However, with this mini-album Long Violent History, this was the point in which some people were beginning to question Tyler's creativity, as it was mostly drab fiddle recordings with mostly trite instrumental quality. And it's been three years since the release of his last real album, so the amount of anticipation for new music has been whimpering down as many other artists have released music since then, arguably being superior than Tyler's offerings in recent memory, such as Charles Wesley Godwin, Zach Bryan, and Ian No. But the wait is over and he's finally returned and has seemingly done another left hook, heading over into the gospel territory of country music. And not just doing that, but attempting to lay down a bit of a concept. Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven while providing 8 new tracks is actually the same album done 3 times under different musical lenses, arrangements, and production all in an attempt to compare and contrast the perspectives of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. With each album being the same yet completely different. And I'll get into that specific aspect later but in the meantime I just want to get into the bass songs themselves. The opening track is a variation of the John Whitfield Vaughn song The Old Country Church recorded originally by I believe the King Sacred Quartet. This version has a few different variations and phrasing but that typically happens when you're dealing with songs as old as this one. It doesn't really change the meaning of the song in any way, it's more so just a note. However, musically, it does have that Childers effect we've come to know him for. With electric guitars abundance across the track and its rather odd composition, and Childers' expression doesn't really go into the gospel direction like many have done in the past. It's just a simple story of a person growing up reflecting upon their face and the memories of growing up with their hometown church and the impact it's left on them. It's an exceptional cover and takes a classic and spinning it in a very new, enjoyable direction. Afterwards, we get one of the original tracks being the self-titled where Tyler is seemingly bargaining at the gates of heaven to be able to be with his dogs and if he can't get his puppies, well, he's going to hell with all his other friends. It's a bit cheeky and the progression is nice and as usual sounds fantastic. Two Coats is where my quote unquote problems come in. With an album being specifically 8 tracks, you'd expect it to be all 8 songs with vocal performances. Unfortunately, this track is strictly instrumental and frankly feels looped, so while it does sound good, it eventually drags itself out and feels a bit redundant by the end. Purgatory is a song most children's fans know because... Well, obviously, but in its defense, it is a completely remade version rather than Tyler just slapping the 2017 version onto here, and fits itself into the record specific varieties. It's a stellar song about the purification process before one is sent to heaven, and Tyler places his face in a Catholic girl for his chance in heaven to, as he says, hedge his bets, which is a pretty funny line that does leave a lot to think about with its ramifications. Way of the Triune God sees Tyler take influences from artists such as Johnny Horton with its specific vocal harmonies and utilization of bass. It just takes me back to songs such as North to Alaska. And this one I'd say takes the cake for the best written song on the album with some superb wordplay. Which while a bit vague, does seem to go through the ways of the triune of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and how they interact with the world of mortals. It's wacky, weird, and definitely feels like the result of a blunt or two. Angel Band was the first and only pre-release from Childers and for the normal set of tracks it's easily the most whacked out and weird in terms of its strict musical composition and reminds me of some of the more eerie moments on Country Squire. And it also taps into that universalist ideology with it basically saying all religions are right and questions the violence and the feuds caused over it. With people he's known throughout his life performing in the Angel Band and choir, it's simply an ascension to heaven song and captures the innate glory and the overwhelming sense it would be to finally enter that landscape. Jubilee is once more an instrumental track and isn't particularly important, so let's move on. And of the eight original tracks, it closes things out with Heart You've Been Tending, which is all about the ascension process and you only take what is in your heart and who you are deep down. This is the one that really captures that purgatory aspect in the purification process with its intensity near the end until it eventually calms down as the track closes. As a whole, the eight original tracks are frankly great. I can do without the instrumental variations, but the songs are clean, they're very well performed and written and make itself stand out amongst the incredible array of gospel, especially considering not many in country really dare to write their own material anymore. I like it a lot, and if I were to rate the best version of these tracks, it would be a high 8. 
But therein lies the problem. This album isn't 8 tracks. Now it's time to get into the concept of this album. So like I said, this is 3 albums showing the same songs under different lenses. The original is based on the father and of course it's a bit more traditional in its style with it being the one that most feels like classic Childers or the Tyler we've come to know. The second album is where things change a little bit but are still inherently similar. It feels very much inspired by Sturgill Simpson's A Sailor's Guide to Earth. While the songs are practically the same on a musical series level, they differ in the musical arrangements. With the father going for a more Appalachian outlaw sound and this one going for a much more upbeat soulful aesthetic fueled by rich horns and gorgeous string accompaniment. And based off my personal enjoyment, it's this second album that I highly recommend, and to me comes off as the most interesting and has the most personality. The last one... Okay, I'm just gonna warn you right now, because this is the one particular aspect that is dividing fans and critics. This one is a lo-fi beats to study and relax to album. Yeah, he really did that. This one is practically just hip-hop beats and purely instrumental versions. So yeah, it definitely does fit the Holy Spirit vibe in a way. I don't know, this is a tough one to talk about because it's produced very well. I know some are calling it trash, but it honestly sounds like people who just listen to country and trash everything else who are saying that. But the justification for this version doesn't really make sense, and the whole concept behind this version is so vague and kind of falls apart. Why do we need them? It's not like they add to the experience in a compelling way, they're just cool to have. If we just kept the second album and nothing else, would anything really change? This isn't like Morgan Wallen just adding tracks to turn in a profit. There's definitely an artistic goal here, but it just misfired in my eyes because the versions never really justify their existence. I have ratings for each of them though. Classic Timmy is a decent 8 out of 10, Sailor's Timmy is a strong 8 out of 10, and the final version, I'm just gonna be generous and give it a light 7. All are solid individually, but they don't really come together as a collective to make something truly spectacular. So I'm gonna be more kind with this and say, rating wise, I'm feeling a light 8 on Can I Take My Hounds to Heaven? Now for the next album, Ashley McBride's Lindyville. Ashley McBride is another artist I immensely respect, and has built her reputation as probably the best woman in the mainstream today. With increasingly countryer sounds and incredible writing to her powerful delivery harboring back to a richer age of country. Her stories are equally empowering as they are unorthodox. Girl Going Nowhere I'd still say has the best emotional story of any of her albums and not quite the best production behind it, and Never Will is definitely her most personal album with way better presentation. And Lindyville, upon its announcement, had me worried, not gonna lie. It felt all too similar to other ventures done by Brandy Clark, who was actually a part of this album, and even older Casey Musgraves. And I didn't want this album to be a retread on those albums taking their ideas and putting them into a weaker lens. So I kept my expectations surprisingly low, especially considering who was a part of this album and the abundance of them. I was afraid it wouldn't even meet those expectations. And it didn't. In fact, it absolutely surpassed them. This album stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bronco as one of the best and most important mainstream albums to come out in recent memory. I was blown away with just how well-realized this album is, its evolution of Ashley, and its absolutely captivating story. I'll get my problems out of the way right now. I don't really love Pillbox Patty. Her delivery just doesn't work for me, and she's on quite a few tracks, and it sort of bums me out. And John Osborne, while very good helming the production, can lose me a little bit in a few areas on some songs with their electronic elements on their voices, feeling too off for brief moments. But that's it. That's all my problems, which in the grand scheme of things don't matter all that much. This album is truly incredible. It feels like an elaborate stage play that just sucks you into this world of messy drama, dark secrets, and hilarious scenarios. It's less of an Ashley McBride album and more so a collaborative effort by some of the best and most respected in the world of Nashville. From Brandy Clark to the Brothers Osborne to Kaylee Hammock among others. In fact, Ashley doesn't even take center stage until the very end. Everyone gets equal time to shine to highlight different aspects of this town, specifically in its problematic characters, shining their quirks, their good and bad traits, making this seem like a real town, even if it is fictional. And I love how this album starts pretty comedically and doesn't take itself quite seriously. The PG radio filter on Ashley is gone and it makes it explicitly clear this is more adult. Even if the early songs themselves are jokes, their execution is taken far more seriously than so much of what has come out this year. It's a story that follows a variety of kooky characters as they navigate their lives in this messy town. With the hilarious track of Brenda Put Your Bra on going from illustrious track to more of a redneck rock and roll vibe, Jesus Jenny showing a friend trying to help Jenny get out of a nasty hangover, and it sounds really sad on paper but it still manages to have some quirky moments. And holy shit if these dogs could talk. 
What a comedic riot, a song all about how our pets could reveal things nobody else knows. I don't even want to get into this track too much because it feels wrong to spoil these jokes. But after the comedic riot that is the first chunk of this album, it slowly begins to go beyond the comedic tendencies. The Brothers Osborne track, Play Ball, shows a troubled youth get taken under the wing of a keeper named Pete, and the impact he had on his life, giving him values of work ethic and faith, and how he built himself back up from practically nothing. The Lindyville Gazette shows the sleazier side of town, with the characters portrayed by Brandy and Aaron Radier attempting to hook up extramaritally. Which is another thing, these songs aren't just stories sung by various artists, the artists are the characters, most interacting with one another in strange and often destructive ways. This portion of the album is intentionally designed to be the most batshit insane part with its explicit nature. But then it begins to show the messier side of broken people barely getting by, struggling with money, friendships, and just life in general. The choices made in the comedic side, believe it or not, does affect these characters and relationships. And at the end, while this town may seem destructive, even toxic, and nowhere near a proper place to live, Ashley does her only solo song on the album showing the inherent beauty and tragedy of Lindyville. It's not a story about looking down upon small town life, nor is it trying to portray it as perfect. It's a problematic place she shares a connection with, and I know people who have struggled with this feeling of their problematic home can relate immensely. Life isn't perfect for people growing up, but there can still be memories and stories we can cherish if we stay or even leave. As a whole, I adore this album. I didn't even mention how unbelievably country it is, but it completely ditches going for casual listeners and goes straight for people who love her and aim its message for people who love to sink and ponder the story's meaning. It even nails the interludes, which add a lot of levity to the proceedings when the story begins to take its turn into more mature directions. Lindyville is easily Ashley McBride's best album yet, and it's unreal it's allowed to exist. Just an uncompromising vision helmed by some of the best in the field. 9 out of 10. All in all, what a week. These are some of the most boundary-pushing mainstream albums in years for very different reasons, and I believe the impact they'll leave will be large and vast. But seriously though, don't have this many people release music on the same day again. This was a lot. I, I, I don't want to do it again. Okay, bye!